Well, welcome today to There's Always a Way. I don't know if you're in your car on a treadmill. Uh, I don't know if you got your headset on on an airplane, or maybe you're sitting in a class and you decided, nah, I want to I want to hear something else. So however you've joined us, we're pumped. Our guest today is Dr. Robbie Gallaty. And I'm going to tell you something, Robbie. Uh, I've been a big fan. Uh, your testimony is uh, one of the supreme grace of God. And it's just exciting uh, to see a fellow junkie and mess up and uh, kind of a castaway uh, be rescued and watch the great and amazing things the Lord has done. For all of our listeners, I want to just share with them in case they don't know, they may know you as senior pastor of Long Hollow. They may have heard you at a conference. They may have read several of your books. Uh, maybe they've heard about the phenomenal revival that God did in the midst of COVID. I mean, there's a hundred things we could talk about. Uh, I'm going to try to pick cherry pick some of the ones that fascinate me. But uh, I just want our listeners to know uh, Robbie wasn't born. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robbie, he wasn't born Reverend uh, Gallantry. Uh, he was a young man for three years, battled drug addiction, $180 a day heroin habit. Uh, I joy popped uh, methamphetamine. I shot meta methamphetamine. And uh, if I had to come up with $180 worth of something, I would have been in trouble. So I, I know there had to be a lot of ingenuity going into you do what you got to do to support a habit like that. Now, imagine heroin, cocaine. Uh, one time he writes about it very candidly that uh, he stole 15,000 from his parents. He lived without gas and electricity and water for months. And, and I've lost a handful of friends. But when I read, Robbie, you lost eight of your friends due to drugs. Uh, man, that really hit me hard. Brought a lot of, a lot of memories back because I swore over many a grave I'm going to stop. I'm not going to do this. And then hours later, be, you know, right back at it. Mm -hmm. So Robbie was all of this in the new Orleans area. Where, where were you growing up? Yeah. So, I mean, that was, that was kind of the culture of new Orleans, you know, they say la bon ton relay is kind of a saying, let the good times roll. And mm -hmm. man, I just lived it up. I mean, I started drinking alcohol, around family probably at 15 or 16 just was part of the culture i remember in high school i would go to the bar before my senior year games and drink a blood of mary to ease the nerves and go play high school basketball and i was in a pretty rigorous division the catholic league in new orleans but uh yeah that was part of the culture in new orleans and it started though my addiction i never done drugs i was an athlete but my addiction started when I got into a car accident, rear-ended by an 18-wheeler. I was 22 years old. I was in pain, like a lot of people listening. And we have family members like this. And you go to the doctor trusting that they know how to help with the pain and mitigate the pain. And they gave me four things, Oxycontin, Valium, Soma, and Percocet. Uh, 60 of each to begin with. Toward the end, it was 90 of each. And you know the story. I mean, I was addicted to pharmaceutical drugs. I took them every four to six hours for pain in the beginning. And this insatiable desire to get high just overtook my life. And like you said, $180, $200 a day for heroin and cocaine every day to live. You have to be creative. You have to be manipulative. You have to steal from your parents. And so, yeah, I went, I went to rehab twice. The reason I went the first time is be, you know, the reason I went back the second time is I did it without Christ the first time. And I'll just say for those who are battling any addiction, uh, mm -hmm. sobriety without Christ is always a dead end street. You'll have momentary seasons of sobriety. I mean, you can have uh, some kind of uh, a victory for a season with AA or NA meetings, but long term, you will never see freedom. Why? Because you need someone outside of yourself mm -hmm. to set you free from the very thing that shackles your life, which is the sin problem inherited from Adam. And so I surrendered my life to Christ, November 12, 2002, just 20 years ago. And I'll tell you, Dr. J, one of the things I've tried to do is I've never gotten over being saved. Mm -hmm. I just never gotten over being saved. I, I, I read the New Testament and I think that's the secret to the Apostle Paul's life. He believed that he was one like me, untimely born and just felt like he had to make up for lost time. And he made an agreement with the Lord that while he was here, he's going to make the most of every moment. And I feel like that's kind of been the trajectory of my own life. 
man, what a powerful, powerful story. Uh, I was asked by teenagers one time, they said, uh, you know, after all you've been through, you know, my background is, uh, uh, you know, we, we share, we're like the guys on Jaws, you know, they're showing the sh scar from the bull shark and the shark, the, the other one, yeah, well, look at this, what the Thratcher shot did. And then there's the photographer going, you know, he's got his appendix scar, you know, but uh, uh, so one time uh, I was asked by a bunch of students, and uh, about what I really thought was the one thing, I said, here's what you got to know. Jesus is not just the Savior. He's the deliverer. I'd quit a mm -hmm. hundred times, probably. You know, I was very good. I was all stayed in quitting. But it would be sometimes one word would set me off, or that depression would come back, or wanting to be a, the life of the party. I mean, a hundred different factors, but I couldn't ever stay quit until mm -hmm. that night I uh, asked Jesus to come, and I built a manger in my heart and asked him to be born in me. And uh, so I learned he's not just Savior, which is a big deal. I'm grateful for forgiveness and Clint, but I'm also very grateful he's deliverer that he doesn't leave us, doesn't us and gets us through. And then before we know it, we even get to soar some. And, and as you talk about so eloquently and forcefully in the, in replicate, uh, I'm telling you, uh, we get to soar and bring folks with us. And, uh, that's when it's really fun is yeah. when no, we're not wasting our sorrows. We're not, we don't just have a story, but that, the planet's going through what we went through and it's more fun if we get a lot of folks to go with us on this journey. Yeah. And, and I would say a, a couple of things I've learned like you, I mean, you've been there. God never wastes a hurt. So if you're listening or joining us today, God never wastes a hurt. And we know in his economy, there are no accidents. Uh, what I've learned through suffering, my life is just a case study of suffering, uh, even to this day of, and, 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 and not suffering and the sense of I'm complaining or bitter, but spiritual warfare is a real deal, real thing. We know that uh, in the ministry, but I just felt like God has just taught me so many lessons through suffering. Nobody wants to willingly suffer, but if we're talking about suffering and trials and tribulation, I've realized that suffering is the master degree in the kingdom of heaven of character formation. I mean, that's what it is. It's the master's degree and you never arrive. You're always learning. And a line I heard years ago, which is uh, really encouraging for those in the midst of it, the greatest opportunity always lies where the greatest discomfort lives. I think about that. It's a great line. Oh. The greatest opportunity lies where the greatest discomfort lives. And what I know is that the greatest instrument God has to grow us into the image of his son is pain and suffering. I mean, think about it. No flowers grow on the mountaintop. They always grow in the valley. And uh, Jordan Peterson, who, who's got an, a lot of great quotes, but one of my favorites from him is, happiness is always to be found in the uphill journey up the mountain, not in the fleeting sense of satisfaction awaiting you at the next peak. One of my favorite quotes by him. Happiness is always found in the uphill journey or the journey uphill and not in the fleeting sense of satisfaction awaiting us at the next peak. And what that means is you bloom where you're planted. You enjoy the season of life you're in. You're in a season right now you've never been in before. You'll never be in again. And many people wonder about the season, miss the season. So I just always tell people, make the most of the season. Man, no question. Man, I love that. And the thing I love about seasons, uh, they don't have to last. You know, that's the, you know, we go through a season of doubt or a season of uh, spiritual warfare. I mean, there are these these seasons. And we know the Bible says be instant in season and out of season. And so the good thing for me is uh, I know there's help on the way, but I also know seasons don't last. And that's kind of good when you're on a roll, you know, when you're hot, you're hot. But yep. when you're not, you're not, you know, so it's all that that little phrase <laughs> has always been a help to me. Robbie, and what what is the word that one word to define your ministry? I know you've called your ministry replicate. I know you've written on it. I know it's a term that's getting, you know, it's a, it's out there. It's part of uh, ministry lingo, if you will, uh, for folks that are serious about discipleship. What's the word replicate mean to you? What, why that one word to, to kind yeah. of describe everything you've been through, everything you've learned, but yet 
where you're going. Yeah, so my story is I'm the product of discipleship. So you're probably wondering, how does a former drug addict, alcoholic, uh, raised in a Roman Catholic home, South Louisiana, find himself to be the pastor of a Southern Baptist church in Middle Tennessee and, you know, went to school. Uh, it's, it's, I'm the product of discipleship. So eight months, Doc, right after becoming a believer, I kind of wandered in the Christian faith, faith, like a lot of people listening. I, I knew I should read the Bible. I didn't know how. I was encouraged to memorize scripture. I didn't have a process. I knew I should pray, but I only knew road prayers, formal prayers. And basically what I needed was someone to disciple me. And I had a girl at church who I'd gone to college with before. Her dad was a professor at the seminary. And she said, Robbie, you're like a sponge. You need someone to disciple you personally. And I, I was new to the faith. Remember, no dad that's a pastor, never been to seminary, never really read the Bible in my life. But I said, do people still do that? I heard of it in the Bible, you know, disciples, discipleship. And she said, if you pray for it, I bet God would send you someone. So I began to pray for about two months from July to August, uh, end of August, beginning of September. And there was this young 15 year old looking guy who went to Edgewater Baptist Church on Paris Avenue by the name of David Platt, who at the time was a seminary student. Uh, he was uh, finishing his degree and I looked like his older brother, his bodyguard back then. And uh, David, by God's grace, comes across the church one Sunday. He's like, hey, God placed you on my heart. Would you want to meet once a week to study the Bible, memorize scripture and pray? I said, David, I'd love to. He said, pray about it. I said, I already have. When do we meet? David Platt and I began to meet once a week as he finished his PhD. And he was the catalyst that encouraged me to go to seminary. David Platt baptized me. Uh, I put that off for a year because as a Catholic, that's a big deal to really oh, yeah. cut yourself off. You know that from your faith. And uh, David took me on my first mission trip. David stood at my wedding to Candy. And I say all, and I became David's assistant for a year uh, when he was wow. the chaplain of the seminary. I traveled with David. I mean, it was just, it was discipleship at like the first century. And I say all that to say, I am the product of discipleship. And David always instilled in me early on. And, and another guy picked me up by the name of Tim LaFleur, who's been on staff with me for years. And he was a BCM director at, at Nickel State and took me to glory out of New Mexico. So I had these two men coming together in my life at, at a time when I was a blank slate. I mean, I was a whiteboard, you know, and they were just saying, this is, this is what a Christian does. A Christian shares their faith. A Christian reads the Bible, a Christian prays, and a Christian disciples people. So I just believe them, right? Like I just thought that's what a Christian does. And so I tell people I am the product of discipleship. If they wouldn't have discipled me, then I wouldn't be doing it today. And here's what David instilled in me. Discipleship is always carried out to completion only when a disciple makes a disciple who makes a disciple. Because if you only invest in a person, person, that's a lecture to a student. Anybody can make converts, and we need to see that. Anybody can make uh, decisions. A lot of people go out and make Christians. Jesus never said that. And what really did it for me is when I began to read the New Testament, I realized the difference between the usage of the word Christian in the New Testament and the usage of the word disciple. Fascinating study. But the word Christian is only used three times in the entire Bible, two of those times as a term, according to the Harper's Dictionary, as a term of derision. They were making fun of them. Like, you're, fa you're a little Christ after the guy who died on the cross? What are you talking about? I'm not saying it's a negative term today, but back then it was. It's a positive sure. term today. But Christian is very different than the word disciple, which, get this, is used 238 times in the Gospels. 269 times in the Bible of the New Testament. And so it begs the question, what does Jesus want us to produce, Christians or disciples? And we know the answer. But the word's even more than that. The word Christian in Greek is a static term. It's a term of, uh, of um, description. You describe a person as a Christian. Watch this. The word disciple is an active verb. It, it demands that you do something as a disciple. So you can't sit passively and spectate from a distance in a pew in the back. No, God has invited you into this great co-mission. I love that. It's not the great mission, which he could have done it without us, didn't need us. Great co-mission, it's a cooperation 
with God and us, and he invites us into this great commission to be disciples who make disciples who make disciples for the glory of God. So I couldn't think when we were creating and building the ministry 16 years ago, what's a word to describe that, what we want to do? And replication was the word. And here's the line we use. The discipleship process is never complete until the mentee becomes a mentor or the player becomes a coach. And I think that's a, a way to help us set a goal for the process. Man, I love that, uh, Robbie. I love that. Now, I was fascinated that here you are uh, pastoring this church, and uh, which was a very unique challenge to begin with. And yet you came in, honored the past, but you were you. Were you. you know, that's the only thing you could be. You were very authentic. You were very fresh. This is what God's done in my life. You know, and it was a ama- it was fascinating to watch, you know, having been involved quite a bit in the early years to now see what was going on. But Robbie, uh, I saw much fruit that remained. Uh, I was always amazed. It, you know, you know when I when I say that, you know, when you see somebody doing something really well, and you realize how important it is, then you just kind of want to pull for them, pray for them. Uh, in whatever way, whatever way to help that you want to do. And so, you know, you've had that impact on a lot of older guys, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being mentored by all those older guys. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I just Mm -hmm. want you to know, but yet when all of a sudden, when COVID hit and a lot of Mm -hmm. things that long haul and you were doing probably as good, if not better than anybody else, all of a sudden, everything kind of came to a standstill across the kingdom, with the exception of one or two, you know, notable exceptions. And in the midst of that, I kept hearing these reports of revival, fresh wind blowing. So how, tell us about what happened in that revival. Yeah, this is a crucial part of my own journey, spiritual journey. Well, you know, you know Long Hollow because you and David Landreth, my, my predecessor, were friends. You preached at Long Hollow. You, we, we do events at Long Hollow for SLU. So we're really connected before I even got here. Uh, although you and I weren't close friends back then, we kind of knew of each other. And then coming mm-hmm. here, you kind of got to see front row the, the unfolding of this narrative. So basically what happened to me at Long Hollow is I followed a beloved pastor who the church grew exponentially, not just spiritually, but numerically in a small town in the middle of nowhere, north of Nashville. And at the height of the ministry, 51 years old, after battling cancer for 15 months, he dies right before the congregation in the sense of David just with Herculean strength preaches to the end. So you got to understand, he, he passes away they go for a year without a pastor and bring me in and basically a year. And, and it's a scenario of they don't want to lose their pastor who they love for 18 years. They definitely don't want anyone new. And they don't want this former Catholic drug addicted seminary trained preacher to come in with his discipleship model of ministry. Uh, and so, I mean, it was tough. I mean, to, to say the first two years, Doc, were probably the hardest two years of our entire ministry. Now, probably the most fruitful growing, because God did some deep work in our own life, but hard. And you probably say, what was so hard about it? Well, day one, someone started an anonymous email account against me, called to be an observer at gmail.com. The next, and, and his, his email the first week was, I've been here a long time. You have it. I'm an older gentleman in the church. You're not. I'm going to help you pastor the church. God has given me the gift of constructively critiquing your ministry. And publicly, I mean, you, publicly, publicly. Public. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Public. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I didn't know who he was because he didn't sign his name. But every week it was your your sermons are too long. Your your insights are too deep. You think you're better than us because you wrote a book. You you have a beard that's too long. Your hair's too high. I mean, you name it. Your accent's too. Th- I mean, you name it. And people say, and this went on for six months, and people say, why in the world did you still look at those emails? Now, I had a filtering system, but I wanted to see them. Why? It's kind of like crack cocaine. You know crack's bad for you, but you just keep going back like a dog does on vomit, right? So that's probably probably bad illustration, but you get Oh, you get I got so, you. I feel you. You got it. You're there. You're tracking, right? So that was the first one. The next week, Doc, another email, uh, a concerned Berean at gmail.com, not making this up. And he's, e- he's emailing about the music and the worship and the lights, whatever. Well, this goes on. 
Six months in, a guy who's a very prominent principal in town starts blogging against me. This guy doesn't know us, and his sermons are this. And so all of that's kind of culminating as a storm brewing in the background. It comes to, it kind of settles down, and then in 2019, pre-2020, um, you would think four years into the ministry, I'm finally settled. But, you know, they always say your greatest test of leadership is 36 between 36 and 40, 42 months. I mean, obviously the first one's, you know, 12 to 18 months, but that second test of leadership, mm -hmm. because I think at that point, church folk think, all right, this guy's probably going to stay. We got one last, the last stand, you know, here we go. And they approached me and I tell people in 2019, Long Hollow could have gone either way. I, I really believe this. I wasn't going to make it and I would have been somewhere else or God was going to honor that. And, and, and I tell people it was my stubbornness and God's grace that we made it. Now, here's what happened. What happened was when they came to me, they basically pointed out some blind spots in my life, some key leaders in my church that I loved and trusted. By the way, you have to have a feedback loop of men and women, if you're a woman in the ministry, respected people that you can listen to and not just give lip service or listen. No, you listen to a process there's always a nugget of truth in, 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 in a seat of, of criticism. And so they came to me and basically said, you're, you're about to lose the church. People are disconnected. They don't know you. And that set up a season of time where I realized, one, I was disconnected by running at a frenetic pace that was unsustainable. And number two, I hmm. was disconnected from the Lord because of busyness. And it's the sickness, I believe, the American culture is slowly dying from. It's called hurry sickness, hurry sickness. I was always in a rush to go nowhere. And I was constantly connected to the outside world. And one of the problems with constant connectivity to the internet and social media is that you tend to be disconnected from God. Hmm. You cannot be connected to the world and connected to God. So I knew, Doc, I had to slow down for my own health. I was teetering on burnout. And so I started to investigate something called silence and solitude. Now, you and I both know there's not a lot of Protestant books written on the practice of silence and solitude. And I'm a big spiritual discipline guy. You are too. We, we practice reading the Bible. We practice evangel. We practice these disciplines. But I would skim or skip over the, the silence and solitude chapter because I'm like, what is sitting in silence going to do in this ancient practice for my 21st century life? That's a monastery practice. That's a monk deal, right? But I was desperate. And when you're desperate for help, you'll do really anything. And so I began to go back into the dark ages, and I began to study some of the insights from these guys in monasteries, guys like um, uh, St. Uh, Benedict, uh, who created the rule of Benedict. And uh, I would study Ignatius of Loyola and Thomas Merton, the monastery uh, participant at Gethsemane. And so I started to do this. Now, one of the things you have to do for those who are getting nervous now, you're reading monks and monasteries, Catholic theologians. What I tell people is this, whenever you do any kind of reading outside of your normal discipline, you have to incorporate a technique I learned on how to eat fish in South Louisiana. It's an important technique. I don't know if you know this, Doc. But in South Louisiana, there were many fish fries, and sometimes they'd put the whole fish on your plate. They would descale it, but they put the fish on your plate head and all. And you had to learn how to eat this fish by swallowing the meat and spitting out the bones. Because if you swallow the bones, you choke. And so when I would navigate through these old ancient texts, I mm. would gather some meat and spit out a lot of bones. But collectively, I put together a practice of silence and solitude. This is now March. You ready for this? 2020. March 2020, I'm beginning to sit with the Lord in silence and solitude. It starts with 10 minutes. It gets to 15 minutes. It goes to one hour and then eventually two hours a night. Now, here's, here's what you probably think. Well, why is that important? For those listening, I want you to consider this. God's first language was silence. Everything he spoke into being came ex nihilo out of nothing. So everything God spoke was out of silence. When Moses and Elijah begged God to see his glory, it's not in the, the fire, it's not in the wind, it's not in, in the storm, it's in the still, small voice. And so what I tell people is God speaks at a certain volume, which is a whisper, that word small voice is a whisper. And so if God's speaking, 
and we can't hear him, maybe it's a connection to the volume of the voices of our culture being amplified in our mind. Okay. And I was not good at that. So here's what I had to do. I had to cultivate a practice of sitting with the Lord. I tell people to bend my ear to the accent of the Holy Spirit, which I was not good at, particularly as a Baptist, but I was not good at as a Christian. I don't Christian think I've anyway. ever heard that. I've never heard that phrase before, but I love yes. that. Say that again. Yeah. So I had to learn, the Lord showed me, I had to learn how to cultivate an environment to bend my ear to the accent of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Here's what I mean. Imagine if I take this, this glass here, if it was clear, here's the picture. And I go down to a, a river bed, a, a river or a creek, and I scoop up a whole bunch of water in this clear cylinder glass. And when I put the water down on the top of my table, the water is not able to be looked through. Why? Because it's filled with sediment and dirt and debris. But if you let that glass sit for long enough, the debris and the dirt and the sand and the mud begins to settle. And over time, you're able to see clearly through the glass. That's exactly what happens to one's soul when you sit long enough in silence. So silence is not the end all be all. Silence is, I, I like to call it the tuning fork to get my ear in line to hear the voice of God. And so here I am on the port, March 2020, I'm engaging in silence and solitude. And honestly, I mean, I was honest with the Lord early on, Doc. I, I remember sitting for about an hour and a half one night, I was a couple months in and there was nothing, right? There was no like, there was no like global megaphone from heaven. I didn't see a star constellation formed into a word, nothing, you know, I didn't get anything. And I remember walking into my house and saying to the Lord, just candidly, honestly, what was that? really God, like, what was that? I, I was out here for an hour and a half. I got nothing. And the Lord showed me something. I'm not sure the Holy Spirit tap, taps me on the shoulder and basically says to me, no, you didn't get nothing. You got everything because you got me and I got you. And it's at that point, I realized silence is not absence. Silence is presence. It's being in the presence of God without coming to him with a laundry list of IG ideas or agenda items for him to rubber stamp so that my life will be better. That, that was my prayer life. God, if you just do what I'm asking you to do, it will all be well. And I realized I was really good at getting my agenda kingdom items or my, my kingdom items into heaven by incessantly talking. But if I wanted to get God's kingdom on earth through me and in me, I needed to do a whole lot more listening. Hmm. And I wasn't good at that. Oh. And so about, about three, four months in, Doc, this is the kind of the, this kind of the turning point. I'm, I'm complaining to the Lord about the country. I'm complaining to the Lord about my church. It's COVID. You know, we're, as a pastor during COVID, if you're listening, I mean, we, we could not win. Every comment bifurcated the congregation immediately. You know, whether you said, Mask or no mask, vaccine or no vaccine, uh, you know, come to church, go online. I mean, you could not win as a pastor. And so I was worn out and tied. I started complaining to the Lord, like, Lord, I need you to fix the problems in my church. And while you're at it, I need you to fix the problems with the deacon body because they're, they're not on board. And by the way, fix the problems with my staff. They're siloed. And, and, and while you're working, why don't you fix the problems with our country? We had racial unrest and political tension and Everyone was mad and boiling over. And after some time of having this spiritual pity party, you probably had these before with the Lord, uh, the Lord waited for me to finish. And I just felt like I can speak to the quietness of my own heart. Robbie, the problem is not with the church. Uh, your major problem is not with the staff. Your problem is not with the deacons of the country. The problem you have is with you. You're the problem. Now, if you've ever gotten that gut level honest with God before, it's pretty painful. I mean, it's painful. I remember how painful that was. Because at the time, I would say, God, I don't have any consistent, persistent sin, which I didn't. I mean, yeah, I struggle with pride and arrogance and take, but nothing overt at the time. Right. But the Holy Spirit has this amazing way to put his finger on the pulse of the problem of your life if you ask him. And I began to sit for the next few months leading up to the revival starting December 20th, 2020. I began to sit with the Lord and he began to pull back layer after layer of pride and arrogance. <clears throat> Here's what he began to show me. You are very prideful, Robbie. 
you, you, you're a master of fishing in the pond of the approval of other people. Boy, you know how to couch a question <laughs> to get a comment. You know, I mean, you're the master of arrogance and taking glory from me and acting like it was something you did. Here's the one that caught me off guard. God show me, Robbie, you are so jealous in the ministry. I'm like jealous. What am, what am I jealous of? I mean, you and you would think like you, what are you jealous of? You got a church, you got a family, you got a ministry. What are you jealous? I was jealous if a pastor down the street baptized more than me. I would get internally jealous if a pastor got more comments online. I get jealous if a guy got more accolades than me. I got jealous if the church had more decisions than me. It was foolish stuff. But in my human heart, I was jealous of these things. And God showed me, Robbie, if you can't pray for the church down the street to be blessed in spite of Long Hollow, I'm never going to bless Long Hollow. Because you have to remember, big boy, this isn't your kingdom. This is mine. And so I tell people, God had to revive me. He had to do a work on me before he could do a work in me. And I want to say this to those listening or watching. And I say this with a lot of humility. And I say this with someone who has the T-shirt uh, and the degree to prove he's been there. So I haven't mastered this or conquered this. But here's what I would say to you. The blood clot to revival coming to your church or ministry or your home could be you. You could be the major problem that hinders a mighty move of God in your church or home. You know why I know? Because it was me. Another thing I learned, Doc, through that season is every great movement of God, you're a revivalist, you'll, you'll affirm this, I believe. Every great movement of God begins by not moving. Hmm. Find them, study them, I study them. Every great movement of God, whether it was the 1857 Lampier revival in New York, or whether it was Count Zinzendorf, uh, with, with the Moravians, you, you find John Wesley, Edward, they, it was a group of people who said, God, I'm not going to move until you move. And they did, they sat in the presence of God. And so that started this revival short, shortly what happened. God spoke to me clear as day, two words, spontaneous baptism. I was on the porch. Uh, I never thought about those words before. Remember, I'm not a pastor's son. I, I heard abuses of that, but I offered it to the church. The last day we were going to meet in person. Uh, right before COVID, we had to go online for a season. We were leading the nation in COVID cases at the time, not the list you want to be on. And we offered it. And God gave me a number. He's only done this twice over the past two and a half years. He gave me a number, the number 100, which is really a fascinating number because when was the last time you saw 100 people spontaneously baptized, COVID, stay at home, don't come. If you do, you know, come protected. If you don't want to do that, you know, and so it was the lowest attended Sunday service services we've ever had. And by God's grace, we baptized 99 people on that first day. And I thought it was over, but it began a move of God that lasted in a white hot fashion for six and a half months. Yeah. And we saw the, the, the beginning, we saw over 1,000 people baptized in 15 weeks. Now think about that. Hmm. One, now this is Middle Tennessee. Well, I didn't even know there were that many lost people far from God in Middle Tennessee. But here's the thing that the common denominator, the common theme I heard, from every single person baptized that year, which there were over, almost 1,600 of them, 1,600 in a year, 17 different states, Doc, they flew in from all over the country, from Maine and, and uh, Oregon and California, and the com and I never asked one time, fly in and be baptized. They all came in, we baptized people, and here's the common thread, and I want you to get this. I would ask them when they would get in the tank, hey, where are you from? And they would tell me, New York, Florida. Wow, what brought you here? Why are you here? You could have been baptized at your church. You could have been baptized closer. Here's what they said. The Holy Spirit of God compelled me to come. I had to come be a part of this. And I tell you, listening, pastor, leader, minister, the greatest move of God is not going to be manufactured by a man. This has to be sent by God. When you get people on fire for Jesus, that is something God ignites. It's not going to come from a sermon series or a strategy or a process or a paradigm. All those things are helpful and good. But we realize that we got to, for a moment, touch the hem of the garment of Jesus. And my life is forever changed. And what I'm doing now is just trying to get back into that little moment, that glimpse of glory again. And you know this, you've been in this revival. Once you experience a mighty move of God, you can never go back to normalcy. You You're can't ruined. go back to synthetic, surface-level Christianity. That's done with. You're ruined, as you said. Wow, Robbie. Well, 
Three quick questions. When you hear the phrase, there's always a way. Now, you just probably answered that question better than anybody in what you talked about, how God, God did what he wanted, the way he wanted, when he wanted, and he did it through you and your people. So yes. I, if anybody knows there's always a way, you had a front row, all access pass uh, seat, right? So, but what goes through your mind, Robbie? You know, I know your background. I know all that God has put in you, which it's uh, amazing to me that what a lot of people cast off, the Lord decides, I'm going to use this. And uh, it's a great privilege, you know. I have one great gift. I have a big mouth. That's a, that's about all I brought to the table, all right? <laughs> but he did give me a story, and it's too good to keep to myself. Uh, but, Robbie, when you hear that phrase as a author, pastor, and, and spiritual leader to so many, there's always a way. What run, What's the first thing you think of when you hear that? Yeah, there's a couple of things I think of. Um, I always think of my own life first. I mean, I start with that, and I realize that if there is still breath, there is still hope. Mm. I deal with a lot of people with past like me, obviously parents and counsel, and they always come in with their life in shambles. They've messed it up, guilt and shame, and I always encourage them to think, and I would say this to you listening, the final chapter of your life is yet to be written if you're still alive. And the past is what God uses to strengthen you for the future. Too many people worry about the past, are ang anxious in the present, and are unconcerned about the future because they're paralyzed by it. And so I would say, first of all, I just think about how God always takes a mess and makes a message. You've heard this before. He brings yeah. you to test in order to give you a testimony. Uh, I would also say, too, um, that um, God can do more in a moment than you can ever do a manufacturer in a lifetime. And that's why, that's what the Lord showed me about just praying for him. What's going to change this country is not a new paradigm. It's not a new Congress. It's not a new president. It's not a new uh, budget plan. It's not a new uh, sermon series. What's going to change this country is men and women on their faces, seeking God and begging God to move. And so I would just encourage you to increase your prayer life. Uh, for that. And here's the final thing I would say, and I tell people this all the time, don't be discouraged when you start to serve the Lord, particularly in the beginning, with life falling apart or things not going as expected. The health, wealth, and prosperity gospel has paralyzed and crippled so many Christians to think that if I give my life to Jesus, it's a bed of roses. If I give my life to Jesus, everything will go well. No, here's how it works. You can choose your sin, but you not, you're not able to choose your consequences. You and I sin for a season. Even today, if I sin today, which I tell people this, this has been a motivator for me. People say, why don't you want to sin as a Christian? Now, I know we can't live in sinless perfectionism, but I am striving to please the Lord and not engage in sin. And here's why. It's not because of what I'm fearful God would do to, to me. I'm not scared of what God would do to me, although I am. I'm fearful of what God may not do through me. Well. Wow. He uses a clean vessel set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So I would say you can choose your sin. You can't choose your consequences. It's a great reminder for us to just realize that even though there are some things I'm struggling, like from the past, I struggle with health issues and heart issues. I had a pacemaker put in at 35. And so there are things that are consequences of bad decisions, but it shouldn't paralyze you or hinder you from following the Lord faithfully. Wow. Well, I do believe with all my heart that um, there is that moment where you go, I've never gotten over that the Lord would allow me to be a part of all this, that he let me be a part of his family, that he lets me be a part of trying to help others that are, have gone through what I went through. I mean, you never get over that amazement that of all the, I mean, if I'm the least one that ought to be able to be used by God, you know, and so I, I believe, and I say this uh, when folks ask the definition of humility, and I think humility is when you realize I don't deserve this. I haven't earned this. Uh, there's a lot smarter, a lot better, a lot more this, a lot more that, but he, I get to be a part because of him. I mean, you know, so that's the the one thing. So when I I think of there's always a way 
I know that every time I was ready to go back or every time I was tempted to throw in the towel, I'm sure there were times you were tempted to take some of those other offers that were coming your way uh, and not have to go through what you were going through those early years at Long Hollow, you know, but yeah. when the Lord goes, just wait, you know, just wait. So what a powerful word. Second question, Dr. Gallantry, and I really resent the fact that you could go into a bar and get served because of that beard of yours. I go a, a month without <laughs> shaving and people go, were well, you in a hurry this morning? You didn't shave. I just, so I just, I have to get that out because I want to confess uh, it. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, one, okay. Especially back in the day, you know, back <laughs> in the day. Uh, number two though, Robbie, based on what you went through in your own family and what all you've seen, uh, a lot of churches are realizing the need that fathers are fainting, uh, fading, fading, and uh, our homes are in trouble. And so there's this great new emphasis to have gathering and men reaching men and men reaching out to other men and men making a stand. And so based on what, you know, and as I was thinking about that, I realized, man, Rob is a good guy to ask that. You and I operate because we know what happens when there's, uh, uh, you know, no father. You know, I always tell everybody, I had no father. I had six broken homes and six foster homes, but I had no father, I had no family, uh, and I had no future. And now, thanks to the Lord, I got a father, I got an unbelievable God. large family, and wow. I got a future so bright, I got to wear shades, you know. But what what's the one thing you would say? You got a gathering of men, and you know men from like middle to the, where the, the, they're a man by every definition, you know, even all the wrong definitions. They're dealing with all the stuff that men deal with. What's the one thing based on your calling and but also your background? What do you think is the message to say to men about the importance of why they have to get this right? They have to get this together. Yeah. I, I, okay. So this is a hot topic. We're navigating this now. And this is there's a lot I could say about this. I would say the number one thing we've found with why men are not discipling their children or investing in the home. You know, in the Old Testament, the man was the priest of the home. It was the man who led the Passover in the home. It was the man who gave out the elements. It was the man who told the stories. And today we just don't have that. Here's the thing I would say, men have to understand that their identity is in Christ and not the approval of other people or other things or finding pleasure in other things. And here's the, here's the thing I would say, the reason men are confident is because one, they've never been discipled in the first place. 70%, I think, of pastors have never been discipled. So our men have never been discipled as well. And so that's the first thing. And what I like to share with a man is this, because I'm a big approval-seeking, affirmation-driven, accolade-encouraged guy. But one of the things that blew me away is that Jesus' baptism in Luke chapter 3, it says that as Jesus was praying, the heavens opened up and the the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and the, and the Father says to Jesus, this is my son, whom I am, what? You remember this, well pleased. Mm -hmm. Now, what's fascinating about that line is, well pleased in what, God? We have no record of Jesus doing anything ministerial. What do you mean you're well pleased? He's never healed a man yet. This is before any of that. He's never walked on water. He hadn't called a disciple. He hadn't taught a lesson. And it shows us that even the father's teaching us a secret about how to father our children. Hmm. That approval is not something we earn or something we merit or something we work for. God approved the son and said, you are well pleased before he did a thing in the ministry that we know of. And I would say for fathers, one is they have to know that they're approved and loved unconditionally by God, regardless of what they've done or what they will do. But secondly, they have to show that approval to their kids. Every father, if we're talking about parenting, needs to let their kids know three things over and over. Number one, I love you. Number two, I'm proud of you. Number three, I believe in you. I tell my kids over and over this every night when I put, man, Rig, I want you to know daddy's so proud of you. Well, I didn't do anything. Uh, you don't have to do anything. I'm just proud to call you my son. I'm proud that of all the dads in the world, God could have chosen from for you to have as a father, he chose me. What a privilege I get to be your dad. They need to hear that from their father because they're hearing a different message in the world. And then I would say men need to know and have a, a track or a framework for making disciples. Replicate, if you guys are interested, we have tons of resources you can download for free of 
how to lead a D group or a discipleship group, how to read the Bible with your children, how to invest in them, how to feel confident, how to do it in the church. So I would offer that replicate.org is the, is the reference. Yeah, I've always been uh, just uh, so proud, if I can use that term, of the way, uh, you know, yes, there's the book, but so much of the content you just make available. Take it, use it, you know, make it yours, take it. The Bible Run reading it. plans are Run all free, it. take them all. Yeah, big time. So uh, I think that speaks volumes. Uh, Rob, youth pastors, before we close, uh, we have a lot of young youth pastors that are trying to get serious about their education. Uh, how important is that? But also, what would you say to youth pastors about the whole key to youth ministry really is discipleship, being a disciple and making disciples? I don't know anybody better to say that to youth pastors than you. Share if you yeah. would give them a Here's word the from you. Yeah, the aha moment for me of my life was when I realized the greatest evangelistic strategy I had to offer was discipleship. What do I mean? When I was at Brainerd Baptist, the church I pastored before Long Hollow, I, I, I got there as the new pastor and I felt the pressure of, quote, growing a church, growing a ministry. That's what they expected. That's what they wanted to know what I was going to do. And I got caught up into what I call escalator evangelism, where people get on the escalator, they ride up and they go out the back door, right? And and I know this doesn't happen at any of your churches if you're listening, but if you're a student minister, you know, I mean, it's just like a revolving door. They come in and go out. And one Sunday I was preaching and the Lord right in mid-sermon just began to speak to my heart and show me, Robbie, you have every person you need to change this city already in the padded seats and pews throughout the church. They're the untrained disciples who are waiting to be mobilized to take responsibility for their faith. They simply don't know how to do it. So the Lord showed me you had a you had a group of untrained kind of green berets for the ministry. Not not all, but most. If you offer them a system and a process, I think you could change. Well, the rest is history at Brainerd. I mean, we started with a handful of groups in year two. That those groups grew to about thirty. Uh, group people in a group. I had a discipleship group. The next year it grew to about 65. The next year it grew to 125. I'm not impressing you at numbers, but I'm just showing you how exponential yeah, sure. growth were because the groups meet doc and then they replicate. Uh, at the end of that year it was 225. And from the year, this is 2012 to 13. Now my first book growing up came out and I challenged the church in 2013, grab a group, meet and it was a 2014 13 40 grab a group of three to five people meet together for the purpose of accountability prayer scripture memory and then at the end of that time launch it out the groups grew from 250 to 787 in one year 787 people and the next group year it grew to 12 i think it was 1285 and when we left or came here we expected it to be over 1500 here's why i tell you that we had gotten a place where we had more people in D groups than life group, which was kind of a conundrum at the time. <laughs> but the point, but the point, and it was a good problem to have, but here's yeah, the yeah. point, I tell you that. It starts small, but it's an exponential growth mechanism Jesus gave us to reach the masses. And so if I'm a student pastor, here's what I'm doing. I'm leading two groups at all time, non-negotiable. I'm finding three to five students that I can meet with on a weekly basis. These are Students who are catalyst shapers, these are students that if God gets a hold of their heart, they will have a ripple effect in my group. I'm also meeting with some parents who are key leaders in my ministry that I can get them on board. Now, this does two things. One is it lets them see that Pastor Rob or Pastor Jay, Pastor Mike is a real guy. He has real struggles like me and real challenges like me. And here's what I find. Um, uh, so, Patrick Lencioni said this line, without weigh-in, you have no buy-in. They will never buy in if they don't get to weigh in. And so I, when the D group lets them weigh in your life, but also you're going to raise these men up, men with men, women with women. You're going to raise these men up that after that, you replicate them to do the same. And I'm telling you, strap your spiritual seatbelt on and watch what God does. When you begin to do ministry like Jesus does, and I'll close with this line, and this is the one that should reverberate in our minds. And here's the line. You and I cannot expect to experience the blessing of the ministry of Jesus and divorce ourselves from the disciple-making method he used. Not only are Jesus's words in inspired, which I believe, but the method he used was inspired. 
The way he did ministry was inspired. And I think, Doc, for so many years, we've concocted a system that is either unbiblical or not uh, in line with what Jesus did, which was take a few, invest for a season of time, and launch them off and repeat the process. Robbie, the last thing I'll say is, obviously, thank you for what you shared about David Platt the way you described him, he, you know, I had this little straight little church kid wore his pants up to here, you know, and stuff in his pencils and stuff in his pocket, you know what I mean? And that was the guy, I called him the geek of the week that <laughs> shared Jesus with me, influenced me. And then when it, when I had this experience with the Lord, guess who I looked out, looked for, mm. I sought out. I went to find mm. that one guy, you know, and then for the fact that he, that he's poured his life into you. But then I also heard that here you are now at the stage of life. Uh, I think we have a mutual friend that you've asked him to mentor you at this stage of life. And I think that speaks volumes. Mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, that a busy pastor would say to an older pastor, you know, Man, you know, share with me, help me. I mean, you know, invest in me. Yeah, well, I've always, one of the number one qualities and characteristics you have to have to be a disciple who makes disciples. You can have all of these, you can have all the talents in the world to write home about. You can be gifted as a speaker, a leader, Bible study, uh, hermeneutical expert. You can have all those things. But if you don't have this one principle, I can't invest in you. And, and I really believe you won't make an impact. And that's the one principle of teachability. You have to remain teachable. But if you're if you are teachable, but you don't have any other qualities or skill sets to write home about, you could change the world. And so I know my life is the moment I stop growing and learning is the moment I start dying. And so I tell my boys all the time, uh, until you admit you don't know everything, you'll never learn anything. And so we always have to remain teachable. Robbie, thanks for sharing with us today. Thank you for the great reminder that um we all have blind spots and they're not blind to anybody, but to us, you know, they're kind of glaring in fact, but to us, they're a blind spot. And I'm grateful for those that have earned the right because they cared for us. They pray for us. They they're there, you know, they're, and they go, and I want you to know that was one of the game changers for my life. When I realized, because I saw several men that were the best men I knew, and I'd known them for years, all of a sudden lose the confidence of their people. And one, and yes. I would think, well, the devil got a hold of this. The, de the deacons are the devil. This guy's, I mean, you know, that was my fallback position. And there was that one moment where the Lord said, you know, Jay, not everybody that cares enough to point something out. Now, they, maybe they could have done it in a better way and certainly never publicly, but there are those people in your life that should have earned the right to talk straight to you. And that's when that moment was a game changer for me. I went to every one of my board and I was, you know, traveled. So I had a board that lived all over the country and we met two or three times a year. I didn't ask them to come to me. I went to them and I said, man, listen, no one has proven to me. You love me. You've supported me. You've stood with me. And I want to ask you right now, because you've earned the right, is there anything that I do that makes you scratch your head? Is there anything I do that makes you go, man, why did he do that? Or man, he worked so hard for this and then he does that one thing. I mean, and I'm going to tell you, that was a, a game changer. And some mm -hmm. of the things they brought up, once they heard kind of why I did it, they went, oh, I understand. But mm -hmm. there was a whole lot of me going, oh my gosh. You know, and that was so one of good. the most liberating so moments in my life. So as I was going through Replicate, as I learned more about your life and your journey, uh, I'm grateful that uh, there are folks that are in our lives that have earned the right to go, dude, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. And they stop it. So, hey, Robbie, thanks for your time. Go get them. I know you got an important meeting as you cast that vision with your staff. And I uh, can't wait to see what's next at Long Hollow. Let the wind blow.